Slides are next door to the video, so you guys can kind of page along with the slides as well. Right. So we're going to relive the full experience. I'm, I'm going to do it like a couple times a day. Um, <coughs> all right. So as far as the slides, I got I, I got some feedback from somebody. Has, has anyone tried to look at the slides online? Has anyone had a hard time with the images in the slides? Is anybody using Internet Explorer? Okay. The, so. This, this is running on Firefox right now, so you need a browser. The images are SVGs. You need a browser that supports SVGs. Right? Most, and as I put, most decent browsers do. I think support is kind of lagging in certain places, like Internet Explorer, for example. Um, but anyway, if you're, if you're really struggling with this, send me kind of use it. What do you It's Safari. Oh, it's Safari. Maybe try Would you maybe try to use Firefox? I'll look at you. You might end up plugging or something. Yeah, but I'm using SVG for the class. It's too late to go back. Um, so, and SVG is kind of semi new, as in like 2009 or something, right? So, apparently, news hasn't made it to write it yet. But, um, but anyway, maybe it hasn't made it today. To, uh, where is Apple? Cupertino. Anyway. Okay. So, last time we talked about Fork. Uh, we talked a little bit about file handles. Yeah, that's a question. What the? Where, where, where can I find a note? What's the website? So I sent a link to it. Are you getting emails from the class? Uh, yes. Yes. So the link is in there, and the website will eventually have links to other things on the website. Uh, but for now, you have to click on those links. Uh, any other questions over time? All right. So last time we talked about file handles. We talked about fork. We did a little bit with pipes, just so you see uh, why some of the fork semantics are useful. Okay. So questions about Wednesday. Now that the slides are up, you guys have a chance to review. You guys, any look at anything? Have any doubts? Any questions? You know what's coming, right? You know what's coming. I'm wandering into the back of the room to hang out with my favorite set of people. Right? Okay, so no questions. Let's do some reviews. So why don't we start over here? What is your name? JP. All right. So final <coughs> scriptures point to wrong. File objects. No. File handles, okay. File handles, point two. File objects, yes. And file objects, point two. All right, awesome, good, good. Okay, file descriptors are private to who? Who's the 
Okay, following code. Who wants to, uh, let's see, let's go over here somewhere. Following code, who is the parent and who is the child? The child is Eli Manning. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> What's a pipe? Yes. IPC mechanism. And the TA should be allowed to answer the question, right? <laughs> yes. IPC mechanism, right? But tell me more about that. Tell us more about that. Uh, creates a chain of communication process. Right. So it's used to create a chain of communication process. But what is it? It's a, it's, is it a file? Yeah, that's a good answer. It's a file-like object, right? It's got a read-only end and a write-only end. You get a different file descriptor for each end. <coughs> Any data that you write the write-only end appears on the read-only end. Okay? And why are pipes useful? We've, we've definitely covered this. Anybody? There's a big yawn over there. Wow. <laughs> no, 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 no TAs. Yeah. IPC. Uh, IPC, communication between process. And it allows us to establish that chain of communication process. Okay. Any other questions? About material questions. Questions, doubts. Okay, so we talked about fork, right? But is fork enough? So what would the world look like if I just had fork? I start, so remember we said that the Operating system is possible for setting up the init process, right? And then if I just had four, what would what would the system look like? Yeah. Well, copies of what? Init. Init, right? So this is not interesting, right? Alternatively, I thought about this a little bit. I said, well, you could write your code like you could write all the code that you would ever want to run on the system in one huge function, right? With all these different branches based on whether or not you were the parent or child, right? So it was like, if I'm the parent, run the bash code, like all the bash sources <coughs> are the parent block. And if I'm the child, I just cut and paste all the Firefox code, right? So that would be, what? Terrible. Not a PC way of saying it. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Uh, that, that would not be a smart idea. That, that, would, that would make your system difficult to maintain at the minimum. Um, so I need a way to change a file, to change a process, right? I need to provide a way for processes to change, to grow, to develop, to you know, realize their full potential, right? The system call that does it is called, or the family of system calls, because if you look at exec, there's actually like six, and eight, I don't know if these are implemented by the C library or actually by the kernel, but there are sometimes multiple different versions of exec. There's exec v, there's exec v e, there's exec v c e, and they all do slightly different things, right? They have slightly different semantics about how they set up the environment and other things. But the one thing they all do do is allow me to run a new process. Okay. Did somebody have a question? Oh, okay. Just a moment. Good. So the exec loads information about the new process from a file, right? And that file is required to essentially provide all the information that's required to create this new process. And most of that information is about <coughs> how to set up the memory of the new process, how to set up the address thing. But it also includes information about things like what libraries might I want to load and the entry point, right? So after the operating system sets up the address space, to start the process running in its new life, it needs to know what's the first what's the first instruction, where's the location of the first instruction in the file that the thread should start to execute. Right? So Linux and other units like systems use something called ELF, right? And ELF is not an extension, right? If you guys have used Unix or Linux, you've noticed that unlike Windows, there's not typically a file, um, file names, executable files don't have extensions, right? So when you run bash, it's not bash.exe or bash.elf, right? But there's information in that file that identifies it as an ELF format file. Right? And when you load it, that file has information about what to do when you try to run batch, right? how to set up the address. So let's look at this. Right? So this is 
You guys, I'm sure, have these tools in your virtual machine. If you don't, they're easy to install. So one tip for people that, that haven't used Ubuntu before, if you, if you run a command, if you want to know how to install a command, you can try, and it's not installed on your system, you can run it, and the system will actually give you the command necessary to install that command. So if you're missing something, you type Firefox, it'll say Firefox not found, you know, run this command to install Firefox, right? You need this, I, so I'm pretty sure these tools come standard with your machine, right? But you can, you can install them if you need. So readout, as it sounds like, is a tool that allows us to inspect the contents of ELF formatted binaries, right? And read elf generates a lot of output, so I'd actually snipped off quite a bit of it, right? Because a lot of the, so so loading programs is actually remarkably complicated. And earlier versions of this class at Harvard used to spend several lectures talking about linking and loading, and I don't want to do that. Uh, it's it's complicated. It's not really an operating system function completely, and it's just I don't find it to be super fascinating. Right, so I'm going to gloss over a lot of details here, but I do want to show you what's in here. If you want to learn more about this, there's lots and lots of information, right? A lot, right? But the process of running a file on modern systems is is fairly involved, right? But let's look at try. Let's try to glean some simple bits of information about this, right? So if I run read out, right, I'm looking at bin true. I want to find the simplest possible program on this, right? Remember, what does bin true do? No, it does not return one. The exit code that indicates everything is okay, right? So bin true is not a very big file, but bin true still has eight different program headers. So the elf file has all this structure built into it. Essentially, you know, it's like it's any other file. There's an agreement between the operating system and the people who produce elf files when you compile and build something about how this file is set up, right? And the ELF standard was actually implemented, I think, back in 1999. And now most versions of Unix use this. So if you, it provides some degree of portability between systems, right? So if you take a binary that was compiled on one system and try to run it somewhere else, it may <coughs> not, right? It may not because there's still some system-specific information that ends up being hard-coded in here, like the location of libraries and stuff like that, right? So it's not always the case that you compile something on, you know, um, BSD running, and run the identical binary on Linux, right? But usually versions of Linux are binary compatible, so you can move binary back. So what's in here, right? So someone tell me something about this ELF file that they can glean from this. And I've given you guys some hints using the, uh, using the highlight. Carl, all the way in the back. Tell me something about this file, this, this ELF binary. What does it say? <clears throat> right. And there you go. Entry point, right? So the entry point, what does the entry point sound like? What does that sound like? That is the first instruction that this program will start to execute when it is finished loading. So once the kernel has set up the address space according to the rest of this, it will start the first thread at address. 80,048,890. a 90 That's a virtual address. We'll talk about virtual addressing in a few weeks. But that is where the first thread will start. Right? Actually, it's not 80 million. It's 80. 8. Well, whatever. whatever. It's, that's only got like 70. Okay. Now let's look at the rest of it. So someone else tell me something about this. Helped out by the over here. Let's, let's work this. Let me work this out. What else can you tell me about this file? From the information that's provided by load out, read out. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Can you tell me something else? No. No. Okay. Moving okay. back. No hyphen here. Yeah. Well, that's an executable. It's an executable. Okay. He took the easy route. All right. <laughs> what other What other file types do you think Elf might support? Or read. Well, executable is not, that's not the permissions, right? That's something about what the file is intended to do, right? So, ELF, the executable and... So, it's up on the slide. Just read, read the name of the, read, read what ELF stands for. It'll give you a big hint. All right, executable. Yeah, so what other file type might ELF support? 
a link, like a, a loadable library, right? So libraries are also created using ELF in the, in the ELF format. They're a different kind of file, right? They're not designed to be executed, they're designed to be loaded by other executable files, right? So this is the difference. All right, let me go, I'll keep going back here. So tell me something else about this file. Read, I mean, read the parts in green. Um, what program interpreter would it like? Well, it's, it's it, that's, so, okay, so this is kind of interesting, right? I, I, I was sort of puzzled by this myself when I, when I read this last night. So it turns out <coughs> that this, so if people have used Linux, you'll notice that the file name of this file looks like a library. So this is a standard format for libraries. It says .so usually means a shared object file or a shared library. Right? Now it turns out this is actually an executable right, on your system. And if you'll read this, right, it, it's one of the things I love about Linux. You try to run something, and there's this you know, 10 line explanation of what it does and why you probably didn't want to run it. Right? You know. <laughs> Conclusions, chances are you did not intend to run this program. <laughs> and that's useful because I, well I did intend to run it, but I was just trying to figure out what happened. So, so it turns out that the ELF file format allows each executable to tell the kernel, after you load my address space, this is a linker that I want you to start that's going to help map my loadable libraries into my address space. So there's actually two phases. Again, I said this was complicated, and I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in it or confuse people, but after, there are two phases to loading real executables. One is that the kernel loads up bin true, and the next thing is the kernel will start live load linux.so.2, and that is the program that will help bin true map the libraries that it's using into its applications. Okay? So there's, there's two parts. Now, now, why is that? Right? Why, why would that be the case? What's the advantage of using shared shared libraries? Right. We talked about this a little bit before. Ben. Uh, well, you can share code between multiple programs for very long. Right. And what else? <coughs> what kind of file is smaller? The executable file is smaller. It's smaller why? Because it's not being copied. Exactly. It's being shared. It doesn't files. contain. And, and what is what else does that mean? Memory allocation is less. Memory allocation is less. But but what else? I'm, so remember before we talked, and this is interesting. So before with file handles, we talked about. Separating information into different parts allows me to do what? What's that? Well, okay, okay, but but the fundamental the fundamental idea here is that it allows me to share things differently, right? Which means I can change different things differently, right? So by not mapping loadable libraries into the address space inside the executable file, what does that allow me to do? It allows me to change them independently of the file. So if I make, if, if for example, now, now this, I haven't shown it, but this executable uses the C library, right? Many C executables use the C library. If there's a bug in the C library, I only have to fix the C library once. And every process that loads it dynamically will benefit from those changes, right? So by not copying code around, it also allows me to change that code once, in one place. And then every, every uh, program that uses that code will benefit. Again, whew, I, get, I get tired just talking about it. It's really, again, this is it's just a, some sort of signal about how complicated this is, and I don't really want to go into it. But exactly it's the function that changes an address space, and it uses an L file to do so. That's what you're expected to know. Now, in assignment two, you will learn a little bit more about L, right? You know, fear not. On your system, there are no, basically, the L format that we use is really simple. We don't implement any sort of shared libraries or, or, or runtime linking, so you don't have to worry about that. But you will process an ELF file and use the information to load it into an address space. Right. Questions about any of this? Yeah? I said we can change the library files, right? Yep. How do we do that? So if you, OK, so in the rest of the output, right? So I would encourage you to look at the output of this file, right? And in full, and in the rest of the output, there are, uh, there are basically commands in the ELF file that tell the system, I want to use this library, right? The next thing that happens is the system has to find that library on disk, right? And load it at runtime, okay? So if you want to change that library, what do you do? 
Did you change this in this file? No, no, no. I changed the file on disk. Then it loads, right? So if I make a change to the C library, right, which happens, like sometimes when you update your system, you'll see there's a new version of the C library or some other shared library that comes in that fixes bugs or improves performance or whatever, right? And what will happen is the next time you want to bin true, it'll load new information from the file, right? And a lot of the loading process and what makes it so complicated is making sure that this works, right? Because, for example, I may know how to call certain functions, but I don't know where they are in the file. Right? I know I want to use a certain C library function, but depending on how the library is set up, that function moves around. Right? So part of getting this right is, is figuring out, fixing things like this. So a lot of this gets stitched together at runtime. Right? <coughs> the program knows that it wants to you know, call, I don't know, a string comparison function in the C library. But it doesn't know where that function is. Right? So that's the mystery that gets sorted out at runtime, right? is that the linker helps it figure out when you want to call that function, where do you jump to? Like, what memory address do you do you go to and start executing? Right. Any other questions about it? Oh, Dale. Is it possible if you're making changes to these things that somebody's running an old version at the same time? Sure. Somebody else is running an old version. Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, I don't know exactly how that works. So I think that sometimes when they are made to <coughs> operate, programs have to be stopped. Right? Because I think that's the only time. Because once the thing is that the linker sets up all this information, right, based on the state of the world that the linker runs. So if you change things and the function entry points move around, you have to run the linker. Right? And then only I think that only so. So based on this study, you can find out why you have to reboot Windows every single day. So so that may be that may be one reason, but I don't know. That's a great question. Actually. <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 interesting. There was a lot of um, there's a period of time in the in the operating system community where uh, reboots were a source of a fair amount of consternation, and there's actually a lot of interesting um, research that was done because a lot of times the reasons why systems reboot is just to get back to a known good state, right? They don't know exactly what's happened, but they know what's predictable, which is to boot into the system again, right? And I don't know, I'm sure there's been studies on this, but I think if you look, you find that for a long time, a lot of the reboots that Windows requested were probably not necessary, right? If you knew exactly how to detangle things and which things to restart and everything, you could avoid doing a reboot. But rather than figure that out, because it's hard, they were just like, ah, punt, reboot. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but no, no, but, but there was a lot of work into this because people understood that people get tired of rebooting their systems all the time, right? I had a... Small aside, I was working at Microsoft Research one summer, and it was right after Vista came out, and we came in for, to, you know, to start our internship, and they had these like nice new machines waiting for us, and they all had Vista on them, right? You know? And people were coming in, and they were starting to get their environment set up, and, um, and, and people just ran into these issues with Vista, right? So this one guy, for example, had a, uh, some sort of experiment running overnight, right? And what happened overnight? Right? Well, Vista decided it wanted to reboot. Right? <laughs> so it like needed, needed some critical security updates to install. So it basically rebooted. It became the next day. It's like, what happened to my experiment? You know? And it was just, it was gone. So I think within, I, I, I'm not making this up. I think within a, maybe three weeks, everybody in the office had called up IT and asked to have XP installed on the machine. So basically everybody just sort of, ran away from this thing to XP. And, and for what we were doing, maybe it was more suitable. But anyway, so yeah. So reboots are, are frequently not really required, uh, but sometimes it's just the safest thing. Right? On the other hand, there's also these enterprise systems that just cannot, really cannot be rebooted. Right? There are systems out there, and there are system administrators out there who I guarantee you, the thing they fear the most is that they will have to reboot their system because they have no idea how to get it back into the state that it's in now, right? I'm serious, right? If you have a machine that's been up for a couple months, you've made a lot of configuration changes, you've restarted things, you've got stuff sort of stabilized, and then someone's like, oh yeah, there's a software patch you need to reboot. They're like, no, no we don't, you know? We will just, get, and, and, that's, and, and that may be one of the reasons why systems continue to run unpatched code that has you know, problems with it, right? So, you know, one of the reasons that people are able to pull off exploits is because system administrators don't want to restart things. Right? Because they're, just, they're never sure, will it, will, it ever, will it ever run again? You know, like, will it ever run again the way I got it to run now? So, 
Okay, let's let's forge ahead. Um, so, exact the semantics of exact are that the parent process is allowed to pass arguments to the child. Right? And this is important because normally there are arguments that you want to pass to the child. Right? I mean, most programs accept some arguments, and if you couldn't pass arguments to the child, then you wouldn't be able to run a program with arguments, and that would be kind of dull. Right? And I guess you could have every program prompt you for the arguments that you wanted to use, but then that makes it possible on pipelines, etc. Whatever. Why am I justifying this? This is just good. Okay. So anyway, so the, and the process of passing arguments essentially means that the calling process, the process that calls exec, passes some arguments into the kernel, right? Those arguments have to be retrieved carefully by the kernel, right? Because the kernel does not trust user space, right? And you guys will find this out in time too. We have some functions that are built to help you uh, move arguments in and out of the kernel, because the kernel has to be very careful when it's accessing user addresses, because the user could be trying to do something mean, or could have just done something stupid, right? So the kernel retrieves the arguments, it sets up a new address space, and then it lays out those arguments in the address space where the process can find them when it starts to run, right? And you guys know this, because if you program in C, and many of you have, you've written main, right? And main takes an argc and argb. Right. Where does that come from? Arg B comes from the kernel. Right. It comes from, that's the list of arguments and that's how that gets set up. Right. Okay, and then this is, I thought this was kind of interesting. It's interesting duality between fork and exact. Right. So what was interesting about fork in terms of return? It returns twice. It turns, you guys are getting there, it returns twice. Right. So most functions don't return twice. Right. Fork returns twice. Exact, on the other hand, has the interesting property where exact never returns. Right? So there's no return for exact. Right? Exact, you, I mean, you can think of exact as quote unquote returning, but it's not a return <coughs> in the typical sense of calling a function. Right? When you call exact and it works, that's the end of you. Right? Like you will never see, you will never know whether exact works, right? other than that you don't exist anymore. Right? Okay, so let's go through how this works. With a, with a um, okay, so I've got a thread, sorry, I've got a process that is called exec, right? And my shell wants to run bin true, okay? So what's the first thing I need to do, right? So the, the, the thread has, has, is now running inside the kernel, right? That's my <coughs> user kernel boundary here. So the process has made a system call, it's running inside the kernel. What's the first thing I need to do here? Anybody? What's that? Do I, no. Do I need to run fork? No, no, no. Fork and exec are totally, totally the same. What's that? Okay, I need to read the outliner. It's one thing, but, but let's see. What did I do first? I need to get the arguments. Right? So the arguments are, when I call exec, the arguments are located in memory. There's actually, I can actually pass a certain number of arguments directly to the system call, but there's a limited number of registers on my CPU, and so I usually have to leave them there. So I've got arguments for the fun, for the new for I've got arguments for bin true in the memory of back, right? I've got to copy these into the kernel. Okay. Now I've got my arguments. I guess I should have copied them rather than move them. They get copied. Okay. What's next? So you got the Yeah. So now I've got to get, I got to open up the elf binder, right? So I've got my bin true file, and as we pointed out before, the bin true <coughs> file tells me how to set up the address space for this new file, right? So this new process. So what? Are the contents of memory that should be loaded when this process starts to execute, right? What do I do next? What's that? Ah, uh, okay. I think I did this differently. Yeah. So what I did next is I replaced the address space, right? And now what do I do? Somebody got the right answer. I need to push the argument, right? So now the arguments go back. <coughs> Let's go through this a few more times. I'm also realizing that I think there's something that's not important here. So this is a good question. So, so what I've shown you here is I set up the address space and then I destroy the address space of the process that called it, and then I copy the arguments back in. So what's a problem with, this? with my implementation on this? Your arguments were from that space. No, my arguments are in the kernel now, so that's okay. Right, I copied them in the kernel. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's some performance issues. <coughs> exactly. I'm more worried about failure. If you destroy the first address space, where the arguments should be copied. So, if there's a problem copying the arguments, what 
what what happens here? Well, fail, but can I go back? No. Right. So this is this is one implementation. All right. Hold on. Wait. I get here. So this is one implementation challenge with exec. Exec either has to exec can't get stuck in some indeterminate state, right? So exec can't like you know. There, there have to be the same number of processes after I call exec as before, right? I can't fail and then accidentally be like, whoops, sorry, I'm not going to return to the caller. I'm just going to pretend like that didn't happen. You know, nobody saw it. Um, so when exec fails, it has to return back to the call, right? And so I have to make all the changes. I have to set up everything for my new process. Anything that can fail has to be done before I make destructive changes to the caller's after space, right? But of course, again, these processes are just abstractions, right? So let me go back to my example here. We'll talk about the file handle part in a minute, right? So right here, there's no need for me to replace this address space in this step, right? I can just keep two address spaces around to the very, very last minute, right? And I can essentially copy the arguments into this address space. I can do everything I need to do, and then actually I can just start the new thread running over here. I can create a new process container. And then once everything's set up, I can kill the other process. Right? So again, when you guys implement this, I think you'll start to get it, which is that these are just abstractions, right? So there's there's no real like box here that I can only have one address space in, right? Yeah, question. Uh, even if exec succeeds, you want to return to the bash, right? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Bash is no more. But if exec, if exec succeeds, okay. the, when exec succeeds, the calling process is gone. Gone. Yeah, in case of exec, but usually when we use bash and run true, then we come back to the bash. We'll get to that. Okay. Right? But, 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 so what actually, what bash actually does, we're going to get to our shell. Let me, let me keep going. Okay. All right. So exec, one thing about exec is that by convention, exec does not modify the file table of the calling process. So you saw here, I didn't do anything to the file table, I just left it alone. Why? Because you want to share files between the parent and the child. The TAs are just so... <laughs> right. So I did all this work in Fork to copy the file table and make sure the parent and the child had the same file handles, right? If the next thing I do after Fork is exec and I blow away all that information, then what's the point, right? It means I can never really implement types the way I want to, right? So exec leaves the file table exactly as it is. Right. So by default, the, the process starts executing with the same open files, the same file handles. All right. OK, so this is the beginning of our simple shell. All right. You can write a shell in pseudocode if you ignore some little gummy bits like how to parse the arguments in about seven or eight lines. Right. So this is the beginning of it. Right. So what does this code do? Oh, I should have oh, printed a prop, but that would have required another line. Okay. What does this code <coughs> Right. So I read a line of input from the sh from the shell, and again, if I was if I was implementing a real shell, I would have like a pretty prompt that I would print right, to, to tell you that I'm ready for input, right? But I read a line of input, and again, I just made up this function. It doesn't exist, but and then I fork. Right? Because I'm going to, I want to stay around, right? Because if I, what happens if I just call exec? I could do that, right? I could just call exec. What would happen then? The shell is gone, right? There's no shell no more, right? So I could just call exec, and then when that process exited, that would be the end, right? There'd be no shell for me to refer to, right? So I wouldn't be able to run. If I want to, want to, if I want to write a shell that only takes, only executes one line of input, then that works fine. But that's not a very useful shell. Okay? So I call fork. So if return code equals zero, so what does this mean? The child. And the child. I call exec. And I replace myself with whatever new process the user wanted to start. So this is really, it's almost as simple, right? But what's missing here, right? What, what would actually happen if I ran this code? What's that? Well, you know, but what's, what's going to happen is it's going to come back to this line here, and it's going to try to read another line of input, right? And now what's going to happen is it's actually going to be competing for the console with whatever started up, right? 
You can write the shell, it's really annoying, right? Because it's like, because basically the characters are, are both, both processes, they're sharing file handles, remember? So both processes are trying to, trying to grab characters from the console, and it's kind of like whoever, whoever wins, right? And, and so it's very difficult to have speed commands because the shell is sitting there trying to get something, right? Okay, so what I need to do, if I have time for this, okay, we'll try to get this. What I need to do is implement, well, this is a couple things. So we talked about this already. <coughs> but what am I missing here in my process model? There's two pieces left. And these, these are, I think, in many ways, much simpler than the other. Okay, well, well no, you're, you're getting ahead of me. So how, do, how does the process indicate that it's finished executing? Right? Well, it turns out that there's actually a system call for this, right? So, so you guys who have, I'm going to come back to this at the end of the, end of the class, but anyone who's used, who's written C code, right? Do you have to call exit at the end of your main? No. 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 The reason for that is that the C library calls exit for you. So when main completes, control actually returns into the C library, and the C library will call exit properly, right? But every process, in order to exit, calls this exit system call, right? Exit system call takes an exit code, and that exit code is delivered to who? The parent. The parent. It's made available to the parent, right? But now, so exit's very simple, right? Exit just destroys the process of the call, right? I don't even know if exit can actually fail, right? You call exit, you're done, right? There's no trace of you left on the system except for this exit code, right? But as Michael pointed out, I need a way to figure out how to communicate that exit code to the parent. Right. So the last call on our list for today is wait. So when a process calls exit, the kernel maintains an exit code for that process. And it maintains that exit code until the parent calls wait. Wait is another system call, and the standards of wait are I give wait a process ID. And if that process ID is one of my children, then wait will return the exit code. And again, wait is the one system call that I can't figure out exactly how to fit into. Uh, I was thinking it's kind of like, because the thing is that a, a, a process can call wait either before or after its child has exited. If it calls wait before, it's kind of like, you know, you're, uh, well, I guess it's your parent technically, but imagine it's like a relative waiting at your bedside as you're dying, you know? It's like, just die already, right? So I, can, so I can reap the wealth of this exit code that you're about to provide, right? Like, you know, I, I, tended, I took care of you for months, and all I got was this lousy imp. Um, so if it calls after, right, then it's like almost like a seance, like, you know, beyond the grave communication, you know, like, people gather and a spirit appears, right, and the spirit says, four, you know, whatever. Um, okay, so, so wait and exit are frequently considered together, right, and the reason is that both wait and exit are required to completely remove all traces of a process from our system, right? So until a process calls exit, and its parent calls wait, some trace of that process is left on the system. It turns out that there are two pieces, right? One is the return code. The other is the process ID. So the process ID will not be reused. Why not? <coughs> why not? Why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I reuse process ID? Right. If I didn't reuse the process ID, then when the parent calls wait, I'm like, you're talking about process five that died five minutes ago? You're talking about process five that died an hour ago? You're talking about process five? We've got a lot of exit codes for process five. I don't know which one you want. Right? So the process ID usually hangs around because it's needed to be identified process. Right? So processes that have exited but have not yet had their exit code, we call this a reaped, right? Like the grim reaper. You know, processes that have exited but haven't had their exit code reaped are called zombies, right? <laughs> And all that means is that there's some teeny little bit of information left about this process. It's, it's, it's dead. It doesn't have an address base. It doesn't have any threads, et cetera, et cetera. It's not doing anything. But some trace of it still remains. Right? So getting weight and exit right is going to be doubling a little bit on assignment two because it creates an interesting synchronization issue. Right? A process, the semantics of weight are that a process is supposed to be guaranteed to be able to collect the exit code of its children, right? When a child exits, whoever its parent is at that moment is supposed to be able to collect the exit code. And 
But you can have situations where, for example, the parent is calling wait and the child is calling exit right around the same time, right? And in those kind of race conditions, you have to make sure that, you know, either one of two things happens. Either wait succeeds and returns the exit code, or wait fails, but the exit code is still available, right? So it turns out that there are also, okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about mode. Wait an exit. So, so what do I do if a process's parent dies, right? So the parent is supposed to be the one, the parent is supposed to be the one that's responsible for collecting the exit code. What do I do if the parent dies? Let it connect the exit code. So I need to, if, if, I need to find a new, uh, the terminology gets weird here. So we refer to this process as an orphan, right? And we need to find it a new parent. Okay? And normally what we do, this, the standard semantics are the orphan process is assigned to init, right? And probably the reason for this is simply that init is the process on the system that will always be around, right? It's always there to take in any orphans, right? So my parent dies, I'm still running, I'm assigned to init. And then, so the other question is, how do we prevent zombies, right? So, a, you know, when a child exits, Again, until its parent calls wait, or whatever process is its parent, could be in it, if I've reassigned it to in it, this little bit of state is left over, right? So how do we prevent, you know, if you run, if you go on Linux sometimes, you can find zombie processes hanging around, right? And it's due to bugs and other things. But how do, I, how do I make sure that I don't have a lot of extra, it's not actually that much state, but these zombies lying around, right? Giving them some time before they die. Giving them some time. So what do you mean by that? Killed after a certain period of time. No, no, so remember, the semantics of wait are that wait should always return the exit code. Once. Once I call wait and get the exit code, the, that, that the kernel is in no, under no compulsion to continue to maintain the exit code. Right? Do polling or to finish? So, so actually, there's, there's two mechanisms, right? The first one is when a child process dies, the parent process gets a signal, right? It's sick child. I don't know why they couldn't jam the I. Right? I was looking at that, I was like, it's only seven characters. Eight is sometimes a limit, but whatever. Okay, so the sig chill. Uh, <laughs> sig. Um, so when, when I get that signal, that signals to the parent that the exit code is available for the child, right? And a lot of parents will implement that by simply calling wait, even if they don't want the exit code, right? Even if they're not going to use it for anything, I'll just call wait and discard the exit code just so the kernel can throw out the exit code too, right? On some systems, so it's in the Unix standard that on some systems, if the process chooses to ignore the signal, then the kernel will just reap the child immediately. So if I send a signal to the parent and the parent ignores it, then I say the parent must not care about this child and I'm just going to take care of it. Okay? So on, on, on Bash, it's interesting. So if, if you want Bash to not, uh, you know, uh, so uh, actually, sorry, this is a different Sorry, ignore the bottom of the slide. So the other question with wait is, what if I don't want to wait, right? What if I just want to look at the exit code of a child, right? Or see if a child has died, right? I shouldn't say that. If I want to see if a child has died, I have two options. One is that I can block, right? So the normal, the original semantics of wait were that wait actually waited until the child exited, if the child was still alive. So if the child was dead, it would just take the exit code and return it. If the child is still alive, it'll wait till the child dies, at which point it'll start running it. So someone who asked a question before about being true, that's how the shell implements this, right? So the shell waits for you, waits for the program that you started to continue running by running a blocking wait call, right? There's also a non-blocking version of wait that allows me to simply, so non-blocking wait will return the exit code if the process has died. If it has not died, it'll just return a <coughs> signal that the process has not died, right? All right, so now we actually have the sh our shell put together. Right? So this is, this is our simple shell. So what, what is the addition here that allows us to avoid this problem that we had earlier where the shell would compete for characters with the child? Wait. wait. So if I'm the parent, I'm going to wait for my child. And when the, that child, so there's the other question, where's exit on here? I said we would, I, I think I guaranteed we would use all four system calls. Where's exit? Exit is in the child, right? Because the only way that this call completes is if the child calls exit. Right? And again, the child will call it. 
So I'm almost out of time, but let me quickly make a remark about Erno and the C library in general. So some of you guys who have programmed in C have used some of these system calls, or you, this is what I should say, you think you've used some of these system calls, right? It turns out that the fork that you call when you program in C does, is not a direct system call. What it does is it's a function provided by the C library that changes the semantics of fork slightly, right? So you call the C library function, I think sometimes it's even implemented as just a macro, right? And what it does is it takes the arguments you passed, it might rearrange them a little bit, and then it passes them into the kernel. And then when the kernel returns, one of the significant things it does is it sets Erno, right? So people who have used C are familiar with Erno, right? Erno is a global variable that's set that indicates after I make certain system or library calls if there was a problem, right? The kernel does not set Erno, right? The kernel simply returns arguments or returns an exit code from a, from a system call, right? The C library is responsible for calling error, right? So I just want to point and make, make sure you guys understand, when you start to do assignment two and you start to read about what you're asked, asked to implement in that assignment, the semantics of sysfork, six exit, sysweight, the system call versions of these are different than you might be used to if you're really familiar with programming in C, right? So just keep that in mind, right? And you can, if you want to, You've got all the code for your system. So if you want to see how the C library that I gave you, that we gave you, modifies the arguments, go look at it. It's right there. Every time when you, when you do a make in your source directory and you compile all the user tools, one of the things you build is a C library. So. All right, so next week we are going to take, you know, we've basically been up here. We've, we've been looking at the kernel from the perspective of applications, right? We're looking at the kernel interface, the system call, okay? On Monday, we're going to start what might be a little bit more fun, which is getting down and dirty into the world of hardware, right? So we're going to talk about what are the problems with hardware, what are the key abstractions, what are the things that the kernel is trying to, that the kernel has to be able to do to multiplex resources and to create these abstractions, right? So my intended plan is to try to do basically a week on, you know, interrupts, how the kernel gets control, special features of kernel code that allow them to do certain things. Um, I'm kind of thinking a little bit about front, right? Then we're going to do a week on synchronization, which you will appreciate because by that point we'll be working on assignment one, which has a lot of synchronization. And then we will do a week S on schedule, right? And that's as far as I can see in the future. So I will see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend.